It's the second week of Advent. And Advent is a special time in the church year. It's the beginning of the church year. It, the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. And so the Christian year begins with a reflection on the fact that we have to wait for God to come into the world. And then the rest of the year has different themes in it, but it begins with the sense of longing for God to do something. And then the candles that we light each week, these candles have themes. One week, it's hope. Last week was hope. This week, it's love. Then we also have the themes of joy and peace. And so there's that sense that there are things that are important to the faith and important to our experience of what it means to follow Jesus. And we celebrate that in the themes and the readings that we have around the candles. Now love, our theme for this week, is a huge concept. It ranges from the picture that we have of the love of God in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The pinnacle of love. So our word of, for love goes all the way from that sublime concept to things that are a little less. Let's take a look on screen. Hello, girls, can't you come up tonight? Can't you come up tonight? Can't you come up tonight? Buffalo girl, can't you come up tonight? And dance by the light of the Hot dog, just like an organ. Beautiful. I told Harry I thought I'd be bored to death. You should have seen the commotion in that locker room. I, I had to knock down three people to get this stuff we're wearing here. Let me, let me hold that old wet dress of yours. Do I look as funny as you do? I guess I'm not quite the football type. I, you, you look wonderful. You know, if it wasn't me talking, I'd say you were the prettiest girl in town. Well, why don't you say it? Well, I don't know. Maybe I will say it. How old are you anyway? Eighteen. Eighteen? It was only last year you were seventeen. Too young or too old? Oh, no, no. Just right. Your age fits you. Yes, sir. You, you look a little older without your clothes on. I, I mean, uh, without a dress, you look older. I, I, you, I mean, younger. You look... Uh, you just... Uh -oh. Uh oh Oh, I'm on the way here. Sir, by train, please. A pox upon me for a clumsy lout. You're, uh... Your caboose, me lady. You may kiss my hand. Hmm. Hey. Hey, Mary. As I was lumbering down the street, down the street, down the street. Okay, then I'll throw a rock at the old Granville house. Oh, no, don't. I, I love that old house. No, you see, you make a wish and then try and break some glass in. You've got to be a pretty good shot nowadays, too. too oh, no, watch. George, don't. It, it's full of romance, that old place. I'd like to live in it. In that place? Uh-huh. I wouldn't live in it as a ghost. Now, watch. There's right in the second floor there, see? What'd you wish, George? Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full. Mary, I know what I'm gonna do tomorrow, and the next day, and next year, and a year after that, I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I'm gonna see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know, and then I'm gonna build things. I'm gonna build airfields, I'm gonna build skyscrapers a hundred stories high, I'm gonna build bridges a mile long. Were well, you gonna throw a rock? Hey, that's pretty good. What'd you wish, Mary? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? tonight can't, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Dance by the light of the moon. What do you wish when you threw that rock? Oh, no. Come on, no. tell me. If I don't, it might not come through. What is it you want, Mary? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. I'll take it. Then what? Well, then you could swallow it. And it all dissolve, see? And the moonbeams would shoot out of your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. 
Am I talking too much? Yes. Why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her to death? How's that? Why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her to death? Want me to kiss her, huh? Oh, youth is wasted on the wrong people. Well, we are looking at the issue of love using the help of the movie It's a Wonderful Life. And here in this clip, we see a fair amount of enthusiasm in the relationship. We know, even if it feels a little hokey because of the 60 years that's uh, transpired since the movie's been uh, filmed, we know what's going on there. It's infatuation and desire. It's romance. And romance is exciting. And romance, desire, can be the seedbed of real love, but it's not yet the full expression of love. It's only a start. As human beings, we, we're made to love and to be loved. As Christians, we're called to love. And so I want to go to a passage right now. The passage is in 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 7 to 9. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the work of your spirit, and we ask that your spirit work in us now. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. This passage calls us to love one another. It's part of God's calling into our life. It's built into us as human beings, and then as God redeems us as Christians, he calls us to a deeper expression of that love. But despite how deeply we long for love, despite how much we want to love well, we have to face the fact that real love is in short supply in the world. There's not enough, it's not consistent, there's a lot of desire, but there's not a lot of selfless action for follow-through. We go to a holiday dinner and we hope for peace and we resolve to, to have a peaceful time together and yet some kind of ugly argument begins and we participate in it. We long for our kids to have the perfect Christmas and we get so strung out trying to arrange all the pieces that we end up yelling at them when they touch the Christmas tree. We try to be nice, and yet somebody hits our button, and we don't want to even be in the same room as them. These things are the way we experience life. Real love isn't easy, and real love isn't natural. Dallas Willard, a famous theologian and Christian author, defines love this way. He says, love is to will what is best for the other. To will what is best for the other. Let's think about that for a moment. We often think about the desire part of love, the lightheartedness, the... the uh, the thing that's going on between George and Mary in this uh, clip, their budding romance. He wants to give her everything. He desires her, and he desires to give her everything. All the excitement of his future hopes. Desire is part of love. I've shared with many of you before the fact that that's been part of my relationship with Debbie. Debbie. There were times early in our marriage that I would go out, and, and particularly in holiday seasons, and I would go out and I would look at all the things in the store windows, and I would say, boy, that's just right for her. Man, that color is, is her color. And I would come home and say, Debbie, I, I saw this wonderful scarf or skirt or whatever it was, 
and I almost got it for you. I can't believe it. I've said this more than once. I still can't believe that that's really part of my story. Love starts with desire, but we can tell that that's insufficient. There has to be some follow-up. It's not yet complete love. If I hear about the plight of the Wah people and the child soldiers there, and, and I want, you know, I desire to see their lives made better, for people to somehow to protect them. But if it ends just there with me thinking those thoughts, it's not yet love. So if the first point I want to make about love is that it begins with desire, the second point I want to make is love moves to decision. You've got to decide to act. We have to decide to do something about what we desire. If I care about those child soldiers, then I may decide to give money to support people who are trying to protect them and educate them. That's part of real love. I can remember another time, a long time ago, at LSU. I was between classes and I and I saw this beautiful young woman, woman that I knew from Bible study. And it was absolutely storming. And she didn't have an umbrella, and I did. So I wanted her to know that uh, she was, you know, somebody I cared about. And so I decided that I would uh, give her my umbrella and I would run home in the rain to my dorm. Now, it's fair to ask whether I actually did it or just thought it. <laughs> well, I am overly proud to say I did it. I actually gave her to Debbie, my wife. Real love results in action. It's a natural thing. To will the best for someone means that within our power, we will do something to pursue that best on their behalf. We'll work hard. We'll build habits that support that love. We'll, we'll set up points of accountability to draw us back when we're not paying attention. The first John passage we've just read talks about us loving, and so it involves that sort of desire, but it also involves those decisions to act. But it also says that God is love. It's one of the major passages in Scripture talking about the love of God. And so that means that God always wills what is best for us. That's what it means that God is love. It means he desires the best for us. It means that he, he decides for the best of us. And then he does it. When we say that God is love, that means that that is what God is like all of the time, every way, always has been, always will be. That's what it means that God is love. And that means that the Christmas story is a story about love. That's what we're going to be seeing played out as we go through the Christmas story in Advent. Verse 9 of the passage we just read reminds us of that. This is how God showed his love among us. He set his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So it's a story about God's love for the world, but I think we also need to remember it's a story about God's love for each individual person that he touches along the way. So it's a story about God's love for the world, but it's a story about God's love for his own young woman named Mary. So let's take a look at that. We're going into Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. going to begin on the 26th verse. 
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One will be, will, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth. Your relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The story starts with a visit by the angel who announces that she'll give birth to a son, and not just any son, the Son of the Most High, the Son of God, the Son who will take on the throne of David, and his kingdom will never end. That son. Can you fathom hearing that? It's an absolutely outrageous thing to hear. And naturally, Mary has her questions about it, and the angel answers those questions. And eventually, Mary seems satisfied because she finally says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. That's an amazing faith-filled response. Now remember I said it just a moment ago that this story is not just about God's love for the world, but God's love for every person along the way. So that means that this is not only a story about God's love for the world, but it's a story about God's love for this woman, Mary. Now, it's easy to see how it's love for Israel because God is bringing the promised king. He is bringing the one who's going to restore the nation, set history on the right track, bring blessing to the nation so we can even see how it's love for the world, but how about love for Mary? This news is going to disrupt Mary's life. Think with me about what's going to happen. Her fiancé is going to think she's unfaithful. She's in danger of being disowned by her family. She's even in danger of being stoned to death. And when she's past that crisis, she's going to become a refugee. She's going to have to move to a country where she doesn't know the language, a place where her husband doesn't have a, an assured livelihood. And, and she's going to have to do that out of fear that her son is going to be killed by the political powers. Years later, she's going to have to watch that son of the promise die a criminal's death on the cross. This disrupts Mary's life very deeply. This doesn't look like the kind of love that George has for Mary at this point of the story. He wants to give her everything. He just wants Mary to be happy. But God's love doesn't always look like happiness. We've got to hear that. God's love doesn't always look like happiness. And so that brings up my final point. Love disrupts. Think about it. I mean, just on the face of it, you have all of these self 
selfish plans about your life, this way of handling yourself, and you decide to get married, and all bets are off. You have to change the way you arrange the bathroom, your life, your hours, what you do after work. It disrupts. And then, for those who are blessed, you get more disruption. One, two, three. Some of you have had the courage to have more. Children disrupt. Two o'clock in the morning, you're wide awake. That's not what you do normally. So, love disrupts. You care for parents. You love them, but your love for them means that when they get to a certain age in life, you are pouring out your time, you're pouring out your emotions to care for them. It disrupts the the nice routine of what you'd like to be doing. Love, Love disrupts. And so naturally, Mary had her own hopes and dreams. Young girl, getting ready to be married, she she had her hopes. But when the angel comes and speaks God's mighty words of love to her, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. When those words are spoken, all of her plans change. A mighty, mighty disruption happens. God loves her. God is has favored her. God is with her. And yet she will face trials and difficulties because of that love and because of the call of God on her life. Her life will change. And it will not all be better. It will not all be flowers and chocolate candy. But God will be with her every step of the way. His eye is on her. God desires her best, and God decides and will do what is best for her. The reason why God disrupts our lives is is maybe because we live in a world that's already disrupted, and God has to knock things off that track in order to pull us into a focus on the kingdom of his hope. Some things have to change because they're not on the right track now. And it's not that necessarily what we're doing is wrong, but there's something deeper that has to happen in us. We have a job, and what we pray is, God, preserve my job. And what we get is months of unemployment. And we have to learn how to trust God in new ways when something so difficult enters our lives. We expect a long retirement full of travel, and what we get is illness. And we have to endure. And we have to learn what our relationship to God means when we don't have something we want. We go to the mission field full, full of hopes. If anybody in my mind deserves to have a, you know, the, the super highway, no bumps experience, it's the missionary. They've already made a big decision to leave their culture, to be in another place. During Christmas, they're not part of a community necessarily that celebrates Christmas. And yet they get there, and what do they experience? They experience hard times, setbacks, opposition. And yet all of that we call and need to understand as the love of God in their lives. Sometimes things are harder now because God is making us into something more than we would have been without those hard times. He's making us more like Jesus. Sometimes things are harder now because God is preparing us for an eternal future. He's shaping a citizen for a kingdom that will never end. Sometimes things are harder now because God is working out something to draw us closer to himself, to build a relationship with himself. Sometimes things are harder now because God is granting us the incredible privilege of bringing his message of hope and love into the world. And yet that is going to bring new problems, because the world isn't always willing to hear. 
Mary is being called to something great, something mind-bogglingly great. She will be giving birth to God as God comes into the world. She, she'll be the human side of the lineage of the God-man Jesus. Because of her faith and obedience, her willingness to take a risk, her willingness to sacrifice, because of that, the only hope that the world will ever know comes into the world. The only hope. Sin will be forgiven. Lives will be restored. Healing will happen. The poor will hear good news. Suffering will end. Justice will come through this moment. And Mary can't know the scope of that. But she knows God loves her. And she loves him in return. And her love embraces the disruption. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. I am yours. All yours. Do with me what you will, Lord. I love you. And I trust you. Her desire to love God leads to a decision to say yes to the plan of God. Her love is complete. George Bailey's love for Mary is to give her the moon, to give her everything. To protect her from every difficulty, to give her everything she desires, God's love for the Mary we see here in Scripture, is to make her a key part of his amazing love for all the world, all the generations, all the history, all the nations to embrace her into that plan. Mary will give birth to God in the world. Now, we will never give birth to God in the world. That was a one-time event. But in love, God calls us, too, to bring his son into the world, to be his hands and feet, to receive love, to live in his loving presence, to share that love with other people. God calls us to that. And Mary's unique part in this whole process is that she said yes to God. She was willing to believe in, in she was willing to be involved, willing to believe in God's power, willing to obey, willing to let God's plans for her future disrupt her plans for her own future. So as we go into Advent, we need to ask ourselves the question, are you willing to be disrupted by God's love? God has decided to do something in his love for the whole world. And in his love for you, he invites you to be part of that plan in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in the church. And in that bigger plan, God knows that people will be saved by his power. Evil will be conquered. God will be honored. And you can have a part in that. So what does your love decide? We've thought about how God's love disrupts our lives. It disrupted Mary's life. It might disrupt yours. It probably already has disrupted yours.